Welcome back, Troglodytes, to your daily dose of guitar information, the Trogly's Guitar Show. Heritage Auctions is having another one of those big guitar sales. I thought we would check some of these things out, because you never know what these guys are going to get. So starting out here, we have a 1948 SJ200. This thing is beautiful and worn. You can tell it's lived quite a fulfilled life. I mean, it's hard to believe it's from the late 40s, right? But the strings definitely look just about that old. But all things considered, it actually appears to be in pretty darn good shape for its age. You can tell it's got some beautiful finish checking, awesome wood grain and flame. And sure, it's got some wear on the neck, but it just looks like honest play wear. And you've got the stinger on the back of this. I wouldn't have saw that had I not zoomed in. I'm sure that will continue to get bit up to the moon. Now, if you don't quite have the budget for that guitar, there's this one, a mid-70s J45. These have a certain aesthetic flair to them, but they're definitely not a huge seller. But oh my, what is going on with that logo there? It's like when they were applying the silk screen, it got like twisted or something, or maybe I'm just not used to seeing them. This is one of those few models that came stock with a three screw truss rod cover. So just because you see a three screw or does not mean it's not 100% Gibson original. There are a few exceptions to that rule. Here's another one of those in natural this time, though a different model. Instead of the J45, it's a J50. Man, I love the logo on that. Really blocky, mother of pearl. Three on a side tuners, even with the big old hump of a volute back here. And here's one you don't see every day, a 1979 Everly Brothers acoustic. It's really hard to see it in this photo, but it actually has the two pickguard design like the Everly Brothers are known for. It's kind of a shame that this pickguard has a little bit more lightness in it, because it doesn't quite match too well. And yeah, those frets definitely need a deep clean, those are all rusty. But you've got your sweet star inlays here, including on the face of the headstock right here, just like the mythical Les Paul North Star. Here's another one you don't see every day. So this is a 1978 345. I've seen a lot of 335s from this era, but not 45s. I mean, these guys got your split parallelogram inlays that look cool. You get your veritone switch, they're stereo, using one jack apparently. So you have to use a special wire to split it into two different amps if that's what you're going for. But it looks like this one has a couple of replaced parts. That bridge, definitely not original. We can tell at least one of these knobs has been replaced because the other ones are gold. And oh wow, I was kind of expecting there to be a burst on the back of the neck. But no, that's almost like a complete black. I'm sure it's just a really dark tobacco, but it looks like it's a factory second. Which in case if you don't know, that means it had a small cosmetic blemish originally from the factory. The 70s semi-hollows don't tend to sell for a lot, but here we go. 1962, block inlays. There we go. Now your prices are getting crazy. I mean, all things considered here, this is really clean. Your inlays have really cool figuring to them. Your headstock has a little bit of wear, but I mean, it's from 1962, you'd expect something. Yeah, that one's clean. I bet somebody's bidding to put that in their collection. But if you want a vintage 335 on kind of a budget, but you love the idea of having a 60s one, definitely go for a post-1965, because that's when they start to play with the nut width, as well as a few other things. You can check out this video if you need to learn more about 335 history. You also have like the introduction of the trapeze tailpiece, which is a little bit different, but it makes these guitars so significantly cheaper in, you know, cheaper in quotations. I mean, you still need at least, you know, 6,000 bucks to get into this market. But as compared to a modern day custom shop, historic reissue. I mean, they're not that bad. If you like the specs that these guys have. Here's a Birdland they've got going on. 3100 bucks so far, but yeah, that's going to go for a lot more than that. The first thing that stands out to me when looking at this is right here. All this green right here, that's being caused by the off-gassing of this pick guard. So whoever buys this, you're going to need to replace this pick guard or not store it in the case with it because as that is off-gassing, it will eat away the gold plating and eventually even start to damage the finish of the guitar and can cause some shrinking and cracking to the wood too. Which is a shame because otherwise this thing actually appears to be remarkably clean for its age. And look at all the layers of binding this thing has. The frets have to run over top of it, but then you get the fret nibbed layer. Awesome block inlays right here with the ebony fretboard and then that cool vintage Birdland logo. Hey, the neck's not too bad on that either with the cool Klusen Sealfast tuners. Now here's an interesting one, Midtown series. I was talking earlier about like a more budget friendly vintage model. Here's one that makes a 335 a bit cheaper. Now technically this is more so stylized after what, a 355? But the Midtown series was birthed in the mid 2010s. And even though this looks like a 335 style body, I mean, it, it's a little bit different. I think the horns are a little bit more pointed, but it really comes down to the construction of these things. So you flip it over to the back. These are actually made out of solid mahogany back here. And then what they do is they just chamber them out to make them semi-hollow. 
So they're semi-hollow, but not in the same way that the 335s are built. Those are maple poplar maple laminate sandwiches, and they press them together and form the 335 shape. Whereas these, think of it as a Les Paul, but it's been chambered out, kind of messed with the shape, and then given F-holes. That's how they made the Midtown series. They weren't incredibly popular when they are brand new, but some people still like these things yet today, especially these custom variations. Now the pickguard on this one, that's definitely custom. Somebody put that thing on there. And unfortunately, looks like they even drilled it into the top. So yeah, you, you just kind of have to have that, but they've got that whole long guard vibe almost going on there. So since these aren't traditional, sometimes you can get an okay price on these. But then other times people ask like 2,500. I think these are fine in that 15 to 18 range and these slightly prettier versions, you can pay a little bit more. But oh, wow, this is nice. Currently bid up to 7,500, almost 10 grand with buyer's premium. We have an old 54 gold top. Ooh, that's a nice one. So obviously somebody has taken our gold finish off here, but we have some wood grain flame figuring right here. We've got a big old ring in the center. I love seeing that on guitars. And then a little bit more flame over here. You never know what you're gonna find under a gold finish, but if I had to strip one off and I found this, I'm sure whoever first did this was very disappointed because they probably saw some flame in this area and thought, okay, let's take the finish off because we think we're gonna see some crazy flames. Not quite, looks like probably a three-piece top. I guess it's possible it's two with an off-center seam because I can't quite see one there, but that doesn't mean it's not there. But as a wood grain lover, I, I, I could appreciate owning this. But it looks like our headstock was reamed to fit Schaller tuners, so that was likely done in the 70s. We've got a replaced truss rod cover on this one. Looks kind of goofy, but whoa, look at that. Somebody has played and or sanded the finish off and then just their hands naturally stained the neck. Ooh, and it's got a headstock repair. A very nice spline repair. You almost can't even see it. You really have to zoom in there. Otherwise you might just think it's wear and tear, but it doesn't look like we have our serial number anymore. And for me, that's a no-go. But you gotta remember, 54s, they're really expensive. So somebody paying 10 grand for this, I mean, that is still technically a deal. Next up, we've got a 63 Firebird 3 in a cherry finish. Over the course of the past six months, I've kind of become a Firebird snob. I don't like Firebird 3s. I have to have the 5 or the 7 just to be super fancy. Like the Firebird 1s, they have their own thing going on. But in looking to document a vintage Firebird, I just always kind of pass up on these threes because I want a little bit fancier inlay work. It's nice that they have the binding on the fretboard though, so I'm sure it actually feels and plays quite nice. And we've got that cool all red headstock here. But sadly, I have expensive tastes in guitars. But I suppose I do still need to document a Firebird 3, so we'll see what I eventually find one day. But hey, check it out, a 68 Les Paul Custom. You don't see these too often. So 68 is that first year that the Les Paul returns. The 68 standards go for crazy money. The Customs also do, but they're a little bit different. It's just like the Gold Tops, though. They made very drastic changes, but it's a little bit harder to see them on these because they're like all black, so you can't necessarily tell if you have a pancake body just by looking at it in photos and the various other changes that they made. But if you're looking for a 68 Custom, this one doesn't look half bad. I mean, it's got some wear to it, but it's definitely cleaner than a lot that I've seen. Looks like uh, replaced strap buttons and probably back plates would be my guess. But speaking of 60 standards, here we go. We've got kind of a, a butchered one. So this would have originally had P90s and or mini humbuckers, but somebody has routed it out for a humbucker. And then it looks like somebody went too far and then had to put dowels in here so they could have a pickup ring, but then there's no pickup ring currently. And the bridge, this pickup has had its pole pieces removed. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but we still have our ABR1 bridge here. Very common modification to have a mini toggle here to do series parallel or coil splitting, depending on when that was put on. Looks like a nice three-piece top, very plain. Dunlop strap locks. Frets, eh, they're in okay condition, but whoa. What's going on with that? That shape doesn't quite look right. Yeah, it's actually got the screws in it. It's like they screwed it all the way past being flush with the wood all the way into there. All right. We're also missing the nut. We've got replaced tuners. I'd be curious, does this have a headstock repair? Doesn't look like it from first glance. I mean, there's a little something there that could be something. But yeah, that's definitely some sort of a project for someone. It's kind of similar to the 69 that I documented. It's like pre-volute, unless somebody sanded that off in a repair. But yet it has all the other non-desirable 69 features. I'm sure it'll still bring a little more than five grand though. 
But hey, here's one of those L5Ss. We just recently documented a One Piece top version of one of these. Unfortunately, it wasn't original, but in that video we talked about these. The early years actually got the low impedance Gibson pickups. I think that would be just absolutely perfect for these things, since they're meant to be more jazzy guitars. Now, I'm not quite sure why the tailpiece looks like that. It almost looks like the whole off-gassing phenomenon, but these things don't have celluloid pick guards on them. So it must have just been how that particular one was stored. But awesome abalone inlays on that one. And it looks like, for the most part, this one's original. Here's an interesting one from 73. I mean, as far as a deluxe goes, that actually looks to be in pretty good shape from this era. And it's an example that has Goofighter rings, which when the factory messed up on some stuff, like if they routed it a little bit too far or something like that, they would just put these Goofighters on it to cover it up. Kind of looks strange in retrospect, but it's got a certain charm to it now that we know why they did it. But wow, that one looks interesting on the back. A lot of wavy wood grain. I like that. But then the neck is a little bit darker. Sometimes that's just how these things were. I don't know why. Like, sometimes it's caused by when people oil the tuners the oils leach into the finish so if you ever see like a dark spot around a tuner from the early 70s that's why but as far as the discoloration in the neck i don't know why it happens but it does maybe it has something to do with the way they applied the finish because this one definitely doesn't look like it's been played enough to have made any effect but hey here's a blonde beauty just in case you didn't know late 70s maple fretboards they were an option up until the early 80s so you can find these maple fretboard variations on natural and black les paul customs does that mean that there wasn't a custom ordered weird one-off finish type thing with it no that could be out there but generally speaking <laughs> those are the only two colors you'll find but hey look at this so the reason i haven't documented one of these yet is i've been waiting for a fretboard that has no wear to it but this one it's yellowed so much that the lacquer has turned the inlays colors because the lacquer over top of it has turned yellow. But these, they've completely chipped away, so they're white. Whereas you got a little bit of yellow left on that one. That just shows you how much this one was played. That's kind of funny when you notice that. What kind of buckle worming is that? That's strange looking. And so is that. Random dark wood grain there. But this one I'm kind of excited to see here. A 1978 25 50th anniversary Les Paul. When I first started to get into guitars, when you wanted to buy a 25 50th anniversary, there was a boatload of tobaccos, and then you would see a couple of naturals. Wine red and black were the rarest. You would never see them show up. Nowadays, it's the opposite. We still see all the wacky tobaccos out there, but so many blacks and so many wine reds have been showing up that it's like they don't even feel rare anymore. It's the natural ones that no longer come up because people fall in love with these, especially absolutely gorgeous examples like this. I really regret not holding one of those monster tops back that I had gotten from one of my buddies at one point in time, back when he was liquidating his collection of 2550s. It's a shame he couldn't have held on to those for another five years because they doubled in value. I mean, this is just phenomenal example even the neck has very good figuring and it's one of the first thousand not that that means too much but you know it's there it's the first 100 that you want but to find a nice top with great condition and figuring on the back complete with original case and original belt buckle that's what collectors want on these things now this one looks like somebody put dunlop strap locks on it but other than that from what i can tell it's original however those pickup covers look a little bit suspiciously too clean because if you look at this, it's got somewhere. But I guess the TP6 is pretty clean too, so maybe it is correct. What? There's no way that's correct. No way. No. I absolutely refuse to believe that. I think my lightest one was like 9 pounds, 10 ounces. These are heavy guitars. If that seriously weighs 8.5, that's worth paying a huge premium for. So yeah, that's something to watch. Here's a 79 Custom. Let's see here. Anything special about it? It looks like it's a two-piece top, so that makes it a bit special. You do find that from time to time. Generally, they're Kalamazoo made. They're not worth paying a huge premium for, unlike a Les Paul Standard. But it looks like this one's in pretty good shape. Three-piece maple neck, as these would have. And yep, there you go. Kalamazoo built. Not the flamiest of a top I've ever seen, but pretty nice. And hey, it looks like we've got some celebrity guitars here too. Jackson Brown signed Gibson SG. This just looks like a basic like SG special type guitar. Not like the 50s special reissue, just a tribute. So basically it's an okay Gibson guitar and it's got a signature on it. We've got a Rolling Stone Stratocaster HSS setup, no pick guard. It's an interesting thing to donate. That's like an older Squire one. I like those tuner tips. Those are interesting. Kind of reminds me of the uh, HM Stratocasters. 
George Thorogood signed Epiphone Special. That looks like one of the older special ones too. Now we've got a Metallica signed KH2. San Francisco Giants. I, I didn't realize they did that. <laughs> I remember after I bought my first vintage Fender and my first high-end Gibson, this was going to be my next route. I was going to get one of these KH2s. However, I'm really glad I didn't because I'm not a big fan of Floyd Roses and I would have never figured that thing out. And the resale value on those back in the day were not so good. And all my original collection guitars got sold. But it looks like we have some artist-owned guitars as well. Craig Allman circa 1970 Les Paul Custom. That's what they've got for Provenance. It looks like our pickup covers have been taken off. And other than that, it actually appears to be in pretty good shape for being owned by a rocker. Here's one that was owned by Steve Miller, too. One of those Ibanez artists. I'm sure one day we'll get one on the show. Oh, nice. It actually has his name right there on the fretboard. That's some pretty good Provenance, I would say. An artist-endorsed artist. And wow, look at this. Kirk Hammett owned 1988 with his signature right there. Looks like he modified the output jack. I didn't think they made these in 1988. I thought 1989 was the start of them. I can't quite read the serial number on that. I guess I could be remembering wrong. Looks like 84 Explorer, but I really wanted to talk about this. Do you guys remember this guitar from this Rock or Not episode? The white Les Paul Artisan Light makes its way to Heritage Auctions. So the indecisive seller episode, he just kept changing his prices for a while, but then eventually he just stuck with 25,000. I think the cheapest he ever had it was like 7,000. And this is no doubt an incredibly cool guitar because it's a Les Paul custom light from outside of the Artisan era. Like check out my blue Les Paul Artisan. I mean, this one kind of belongs in that same category because it's an Artisan outside of the Artisan era, but this is one of those thin body Les Paul customs. It's got the comfort carve back here. But the thing that scares me away on this one is this weird discoloration of the finish and heavy finish checking. You know there has to be a repair or something under there that somebody had to do a touch up of. There's no reason for a finish to ever do that. Because I would love to have this in my personal collection just because of the weird oddity nature of it. There are real white Les Paul Artisans from the original era that have black binding. That's a bucket list guitar for me. But this one, the condition's just so bad bad i just don't want it even though it's like a one-off but the opening bid starts at 7500 i'm not sure if anybody will bid on that or not i mean maybe heritage will get it in front of the right guy who falls in love with it but for me that's the biggest no-no on that one next up we've got an 89 standard what is going on there <laughs> it's like the wood was swollen up right here i think what it is is whatever they use to cut the backgrounds out of these guitars, it cut a little bit too much. Like I noticed right here, some of the binding starts to disappear on these photos, but I would love to know how Heritage Auctions does this, let you zoom in so far and have relatively good detail. But the thing to know about late 80s plastics is they tend to buckle like this. So make sure you don't over tighten your screws if you're ever verifying originality of pickups or anything, but this will also just happen naturally over time. And it's a pain because then you have to replace them. They don't match the other plastics. That's just kind of part of the territory. Late 80s, early 90s. Well, this one appears to be in okay shape. Got one of those DC standards. You can learn about those in this review. And ooh, a signature from 2002. I love SG specials that look like this. They've got the wrap tail. They're a bat wing guard. They've got two P90s. The dot inlays even seem to work on these because you have the binding at the same time. They're just fascinating. I would definitely like to review and document one of these one day. If only they could have had a Gibson Mother of Pearl logo though. So those are all the Gibson offerings in the upcoming Heritage Auction, but they've got a whole bunch of Martin acoustics that I, I don't really know too much about, so I'm not going to talk about them. But look at this weird thing. Klaus Roder Gypsy. It's so wide. I'd be interested to hear the tones out of this thing. Oh, I like that. So do you call this a tailpiece now? Because generally acoustic guitars just have one bridge system that has a bridge and a tailpiece kind of built into it. So that's loaded from the top. Interesting. The headstock is your typical classical style. Here's another one that caught my eye from Taylor. A koi fish acoustic. Now, PRS does like really high-end koi fretboards just like this on like their private stocks and stuff. And I've always been fascinated with koi fish, so I could see myself owning a guitar like that. And look at that nice quilty back. But if there was a hobby I would get into outside of guitars, I'd probably be raising koi fish because they're just so cool. Here's an interesting Rickenbacker. So giant F hole on this thing, checkerboard binding. You can't really appreciate that too much with the white background, but you can see what's going on. Definitely has that whole lacquered fretboard thing going on. 
We've got one, two, three toaster top pickups. They're a complicated bridge system, and I really like the tremolo on this one. It's got like jazzy looking notes on it. The knobs, they're a bit unorthodox, but I'm sure they work. I've documented a few Rickenbackers on the show. They're just kind of a pain to take apart, so <laughs> that's why I don't buy too many of them. That said, I wouldn't mind documenting this. Okay, it's a 12 string. Maybe I don't want to document it. I've already done one of those. But I love this color. It really shows off the whole German carve of this thing. I mean, wow. It almost looks like it's pinstriped. That's just how well this finish works on this. So semi-hollow, double bunny ears, really cool matching headstock, but then you get the tuners all over the place there. It's quite ingenious how Rickenbacker does that. So they do it classical style with six of them right here, and then they do regular style with the other six on here. It's a little bit of a, a cluster of tuning pegs. It gets a while to get used to, but when the alternative is having a giant two foot long headstock, I mean, <laughs> it's a trade off. Cool, it looks like they got a couple of these Roland guitars on here for the guitar synthesizer. I'm curious, if I bought this, could I use it with the Roland Ready Les Paul Studio Customs? Those are cool things. Steve Howe used one. The problem is, is nobody ever has the effects with them. <laughs> so <laughs> makes the guitar kind of useless. So that's nice that this one still has that. As far as Stratocasters go, they didn't really have too many Fenders here, but here's a 2015 custom job, Troy Lee Designs. I mean, it's just... Flames. Looks like maybe ebony fretboard. Really dark headstock. But it appears to have a story. But I think that's going to do it for tonight. They've got some other amps, other lower end guitars, things like that. You can check them out. All right, troglodytes, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. And we will catch you tomorrow on the next episode. Take care.